Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're happy to have you with us for this program focusing on globalization and the world economy. It's a big topic, and we have a wonderful group of guests tonight to address it, so please stay with us. World Canvas is coming to you from the Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum. This program is being recorded for statewide television and radio distribution over the Hawkeye Network, Iowa Public Radio, and KRUI 89.7. It will also be available, along with all programs in the series, as a free podcast on iTunes. I'd like to thank our production partners, the Hawkeye Network, the Pentecrest Museums, KRUI, and Information Technology Services. Globalization isn't a new phenomenon. International trade and migration have been taking place for centuries, and so has the inevitable political, social, and cultural mixing that is an acknowledged result. What makes this wave of globalization different is that thanks to dramatic technological advancements and instant communications, everything moves at lightning speed. Some see an increasingly interconnected globe where, given the right planning, cooperation, and goodwill, almost everything becomes possible, feeding the world, providing opportunity and good wages that lift people out of poverty, curing diseases that have long ravaged whole populations, and the lessening of international tensions. Some, however, fear an unaccountable international set of players and systems that overwhelms less developed nations and forces dependency, resulting in a loss of control, not to mention a loss of culture. Throughout the program, our discussion will center around two main questions. What is globalization and how does it affect the world economy? And what implications does globalization have for the United States, for Iowa, and for individuals? And we'll start the conversation with the guests you see here on stage. Just next to me is Frederick Salt. He's a UI assistant professor of political science. Thanks, Fred, for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm. And Jan King is uh, next to Fred. Uh, she's a UI assistant professor of communication studies. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. And our third guest is Ron McMullen, a former U.S. ambassador currently teaching in the UI's uh, de Department of Political Science. And hi, Ron. Thanks hi. for coming. You're welcome, Joan. Yeah. So, you know, Fred, I think I'm going to start with you. Uh, this is a word we hear all the time, globalization. I think we need some context. We need some sort of uh, uh, understanding of what the term means the way it's used today. Okay, I think uh, when we're talking about uh, globalization from an economic perspective, uh, we usually think of uh, flows of, of four things across national borders. Uh, typically, we think of, of in terms of, of trade, of, of both goods and services. Uh, as, and then we think in terms of flows of money from one country to another. And fourth, we think of uh, flows of people across borders, yeah. moving from one country to another. Mm -hmm. uh, so together, the, we've seen over the last 30 years at least, if not longer, we've seen uh, large and steady increases in all four of these aspects of, of globalization. Hmm. Well, I know you teach courses on globalization. A lot of your writing is about globalization. and. Um, I'm aware that you particularly look into perceptions of inequality, um, economic inequality. Right. Uh, globalization has had uh, some important uh, effects on uh, economic inequality around the world. Uh, and they're somewhat contradictory effects, right? Uh, the first effect is that as poorer countries have become more integrated into the global economy, uh, participating to a greater degree in these exchanges of goods and services and money and people across borders. Uh, the largest poor countries, the countries that have uh, the most people living in them, China and India together, have seen uh, pretty dramatic gains in uh, the average income across the population in those countries. And I think when we think about uh, the well-being of humanity as a whole, uh, big gains to the poorest individuals in these poor countries uh, are, are a pretty um, uh, unadulterated good thing that has been a result of this globalization. Uh, so on the one hand, differences across countries have grown smaller 
in terms of their average incomes. Uh, so inequality is, is lessening in, in this respect. Uh, but the second effect that globalization has had is that it has increased the differences across individuals within most countries. Uh, we've seen large increases in uh, economic inequality measured whether in terms of uh, wealth or income or in consumption uh, within countries, just about all countries in all regions of the world have seen as they've grown more integrated with the world economy. Uh, the richest people within those countries have pulled away from the, the experiences of most of the population in those countries. So while international inequality is decreasing with greater globalization, domestic inequality is increasing. Uh, so um, as I said before, Globalization's effects on inequality are uh, cross-cutting. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so the effect on attitudes and behaviors. Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, as as you introduced me, I'm a political scientist, so I'm mostly interested in uh, the political consequences of these developments, and. Uh, my work has focused on the second of these two effects, the consequences for uh, domestic inequality of globalization. And in particular, I'm looking at what this increasing inequality within countries, uh, what this does to people's attitudes and people's engagement with politics and, and people's preferences for different policies. Uh, and I found that there's, there's uh, quite dramatic effects of increasing inequality during this period of globalization on how people view the political system, uh, their relationship to uh, authority, and uh, their relationship to their own government and, and how they see this relationship and how they interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you draw any uh, examples out from the, the work you've done on, um, give us a country or uh, a region that is uh, experiencing some of this change? Oh, sure. Um, well, uh, most, most uh, closest to home for all of us, uh, we've seen in the United States that uh, income inequality in the United States reached its lowest level at about, in about 1979. And from 1979 forward, we've had a, a fairly steady progression of increases in domestic income inequality through the 80s, through the 90s, actually flattening out in, in, in the, the new century. Uh, but as this increase in inequality has occurred uh, here in the United States, people's attitudes uh, towards authority, just, just is in the most simplest uh, terms, uh, whether they feel uh, that in general they should just accept what uh, political leaders say uh, and, and do what they're told, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to thinking for themselves critically about political issues. Um, this, this attitude, uh, which uh, scholars call authoritarianism, uh, has increased over this time period as inequality has increased. And I think that this uh, really reflects people's lived experiences in a context of greater inequality. Uh, when uh, the rich are richer and the poor are poorer, uh, it makes, well, it makes the most common experience that people have uh, on either end of the, the income scale, uh, one in which interactions are uh, best characterized by sort of command and, 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 mm -hmm. and obedience. Mm -hmm. uh, and May people learn from that. Yeah, um, so are you saying that 
the people are longing during these times when they when they feel that they are they have really no opportunity. Say you're you're someone mm -hmm. in the lower income area, sure. and you're not feeling that you really have any place to go, but further down. Are you saying that authoritarianism is more appealing to those people? Or are you just saying that 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 happens um, it, more often than not? Authoritarian governments. Um, Take well, command. Well, um, I'm not. I, I, I'm. I'm speaking of authoritarianism as a as a uh, as an attitude towards authority, mm -hmm. rather than in terms of a government structure. I see. Right. Uh, some people feel fairly comfortable with the idea that if their political leaders tell them uh, this or that, that that must be true and they should act accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, other people uh, are more skeptical, perhaps, of, of what political leaders say mm -hmm. and wish to sort of uh, weigh it uh, critically rather mm -hmm. than uh, unquestioningly following through with right. whatever is right. said. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, well, the the relationship to people's experiences isn't so much that people um, long for you know, a, a, a leader with a firm hand in these mm -hmm. circumstances. It's just that that tends to be more what uh, they're accustomed to, right? If, if, if you're in a very unequal society, uh, wherever, whatever example you may wish to draw on, if you're in a society that's very unequal, uh, you are in a position of, of relative vulnerability. Uh, and so when someone uh, above you, hierarchically, mm -hmm. uh, says, do this, your best uh, course of action is often simply to, to do yeah. it. Right. Uh, to not do it is to take all sorts of risks mm -hmm. that are l l certainly less present when economic conditions are more equal. Right, right. Uh, th those in command, if you will, have less leverage when, when everyone is closer to being on the mm -hmm. same uh, mm -hmm. playing field. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah, no, thank you for starting us off here. Uh, let me move down to you, Jian, and um, you're in the field of communication studies, and yes. I know that you uh, teach courses and do research on globalization now, too, mm -hmm. and you have an interest in uh, youth culture and yes. in, um, also in attitudes and behaviors. Uh, can you just kind of launch off of what Fred has just said here and um, give us a perspective of globalization from the communications world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm mostly interested in how experiences of everyday life is increasingly globally defined by the movement of people, culture, ideas, as well as economy. So for example, um, in Afghanistan, um, the Afghan star modeled after American Idol is a very huge program. And then for those local Afghanistan people, that became an outlet for um, female Afghanistanis, Afghans, who didn't have outlet for voicing their um, opinions or emotions. So um, sometimes consumer culture or the fashion or seemingly benign cultural products can have unexpected global experiences when it um, moves around globe and then um, adapted into different local contexts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I know you study social media a lot, and I think we're all very much aware that mm -hmm. uh, every day in current events we, we see things happening that have sure. been greatly affected by uh, social media. Can, can you relate some of those uh, things you've been studying? Sure, um, probably through an example. Um, so I have been studying the South Korean youth movement that started on social media around 2009 when South Korean government decided to import U.S. beef. At that time, there was a, some concern about potential mad cow disease. And on social media, there were some conspiracy theories and the rumors about the threat or danger of um, the mad cow disease. The US government, as well as the South Korean government, tried to offer quote unquote objective data and then um, calm the people. But at the same time, those rumors were almost out of control and it became um, the beginning of um, street demonstrations, which had an undertone of 
which included also the criticism of U.S. and the South Korean government. Until the 1980s, um, or even early 1990s, it was almost inconceivable to be anti-American or the criticism of anti, um, the U.S. in South Korea because it has been a close ally of the U.S. during the Korean War and the, Gold, uh, and the Cold War and then economic development. But for the younger generation who grew up after the 1990s, their perspective of the U.S. is quite different. So they were yearning for a stronger nation and they wanted global recognition. So for those younger generation, the narrative of how U.S. is trying to crack open the um, Korean market that was a more persuasive narrative, even though that included um, hint of rumors and the conspiracy theories. So I tried to understand how some um, explanations or some narratives seem to make sense a little more in various different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, well, as we look at um, events happening right now in the Middle East, for example, I think we're, we're aware of uh, things in the Middle East or also uh, situations in China where, for example, Facebook is closed sure. down. You know, there, there are uh, mechanisms that um, different governments and I imagine even our own might like uh, to see have less influence in a, in, a, in a culture or no influence at all. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems as though people always find a way to work around um, the, you know, the closure of one outlet or another. Mm -hmm. is, is, do you see this as, as just the reality that there will be, if, there's a, if there is a will, there'll be a way? Well, I had to think about the terms of Twitter revolution or the Facebook revolution that became a household term um, in, since the beginning of the 2011 when there was an Arab Spring which was also dubbed as the Twitter revolution and then Facebook revolution. And um, for those, I have two somewhat different thoughts. Um, in the, the first one is that there was enough grievances among the local people and then without acknowledging the, those, calling those events as Twitter revolution and the Facebook revolution is a little too simplistic. But at the same time, um, I think that I am grow, um, um, increasingly acknowledging the central role of the social media in generating somewhat um, unintended effects um, as a collective. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. Well, we remember the incident in um, in Iran when it looked as though Iran might might face a, a very different future than, than right. the place they are right now, and that was I think 2009, perhaps. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, the the quick spreading of the mm -hmm. the image of the young woman who'd been killed, um, we hear that that was really very highly fueled by youth and by yes. uh, the quick messaging that was mm -hmm. possible. Yes, and at the same time. Um, 2009, um, at the time, um, Hillary Clinton asked the Twitter to um, reschedule their scheduled maintenance so that the Iranian revolution doesn't get interrupted. And at the same time, the, the Iranian protesters are quite savvy and that they are aware of the global public who are paying attention to what is happening in Iran. So they. Um, were connected to the supporters outside Iran, mm -hmm. and then they were very um, good at giving the, um, the leaders in the country the sense that the whole world is watching you, and then yeah. you cannot do the things that you used to do in terms mm -hmm. of using violence and using mm -hmm. authoritarian um, measures. Yeah. Um, well, maybe this is a good point to move down to you, Ron. Um, you have been all over the world in the diplomatic corps and with Ambassador to Eritrea, and you have certainly seen uh, many uh, people, many uh, nations go through struggles with modernization, with globalization, with uh, political change, and so on. Um, when you think about globalization, what are the top line thoughts that come into your mind? You know, I, um, people often say that uh, it's been tel telecommunications and transportation that advances in those technologies have really driven globalization. And I think back when I was an undergraduate at Drake, I, I went on a semester abroad to London, and I got in a big metal tube that had wings powered by jet engines and flew to London. 
And when I came back uh, 35 years later uh, from flying from Eritrea back to the U.S., I got on a big metal tube with wings powered by jet engines and flew back to the U.S. Yeah. I was hoping that in that interim that we'd have, you know, teleportation or at least sort of supersonic transportation and that we would be commuting in Washington, D.C. with um, jet packs or perhaps private helicopters. But no, we still get in two tons of steel and drive down concrete yeah. paths. So transportation hasn't made the advances that um, telecommunication has. When I was a uh, uh, a, a semester in uh, abroad student in London, I would sometimes buy aerograms, these onion skin things that you'd write on and fold up and mail because it was cheaper than a regular letter. Um, when we got into, when I got into the Foreign Service, my wife and I and our sons would sometimes send from Sri Lanka or Gabon um, audio cassettes home to Northwood nice. where my parents lived and elsewhere um, because we, it was too expensive, $10 a minute to call internationally. Um, later in my career, we found that we could get uh, a line to the United States and then using a uh, calling card could call for four cents a minute. Uh, our oldest son has been a Peace Corps volunteer in Central Asia, and we've discovered that we can Skype for free. <laughs> so we see those advances in just personal mm -hmm. telecommunication, mm -hmm. and the advent of the, the, the World Wide Web and the Internet has both fueled the uh, dispersion of information and knowledge and also made it harder for governments to um, repress or oppress their, their citizens. So um, those few countries that um, try to restrict and, and censor the internet, I think, mm -hmm. are fighting a losing battle. When we were in Burma, um, our oldest son was in high school, and I think he had like 10 different web-based email addresses during the course of his uh, high school career because he and his friends would find one that the junta had not blocked, and they'd use that, and then they'd, the junta would find it and block it, and they'd discover some other one. So yeah. they were always one jump ahead of the censors. In Eritrea, we had, again, a very dictatorial government that censors and monitors uh, internet uh, traffic. Um, the American Center at the embassy had unmonitored um, access to the web, and students coming in to apply for to American universities or you know, looking for other opportunities would come in and use our um, facility. So while it's helped diffuse uh, knowledge and, um, you know, understanding between peoples around the world. There's also vulnerabilities. I think mm -hmm. back to uh, um, the millennium New Year's Eve when we were all concerned about Y2K. Um, in 1999, we spent uh, the last day of 1999 on a little island with Buzz Aldrin, who was the second person to walk on a, you know, a planetary body other than the Earth. And that was really interesting, an interesting way to end the millennium. That night, I had to be the duty officer at the embassy. Now. We were all worried about Y2K, and our embassy in Suva, Fiji, was the first to experience the new millennium. Uh, you know, days start at the international dateline and go from east to west, and so our embassy was the closest uh, just to the, to the uh, west of the international dateline. So we were sort of the canary in the, in the mine shaft, and the State Depart somebody in the State Department realized this, sent me a long list of things that we were supposed to check on, and immediately call the, you know, at midnight, run all these checks and then call back to the State Department to let them know the impact of Y2K. I mean, people were thinking cyber apocalypse, this will be the end, planes will fall out of the sky and stuff. So at, I was in working at the embassy and uh, missed all the Millennium New Year's Eve parties, feeling sorry for myself. And at midnight, fireworks went off and people were dancing in the streets in Fiji. And uh, so I started uh, doing all these checks and, and the telephone rang and I picked it up and. I said, it's not a quarter after, why is the State Department calling me? And I picked it up and there was somebody yelling on the phone, hello, hello, is this the American Embassy in Fiji? I said, yes, who's this? And they said, it's WKTP in Toledo, Ohio. You're live on the air, how's, uh, how's the new, new year? And I said, well, good, it's, you know, people who aren't working are having a good time. And uh, they said, any signs of Y2K? I said, well, obviously the phones work. Um, <laughs> my lights are still on and the computer doesn't appear to be smoking. So I think, you know, no, no signs of Y2K. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, that's really great. And they said, while we've got you on the air, is there anything that you'd like to tell the listeners in Ohio? And I thought, well, yes. So I said, um, your listeners are hearing a live voice from a future millennium. And I'm hearing a live voice from a past millennium. I said, this doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And I hung up. Yeah. <laughs> now, you think about in the year 1000, there was no international dateline. There was no telecommunications. Uh, so people yeah. didn't know what was going on. 
um, and the year zero even less so. So I could arguably be the first person in the history of the world to have heard a live voice from a past millennium. Yeah. <laughs> so telecommunications, the advances in telecommunications, the internet, have really advanced tremendously. And much of the, the advances, the positive impact that we've seen, has really been because of advances in telecommunications. I'm hoping that transportation will catch up. And I have big hopes for 3D printing. I'm, I'm really curious how this will affect our trade relations with China mm -hmm. and how it will affect the value of intellectual property rights when you can reproduce an object yeah. if you have a 3D blueprint of yeah. it. So it could change the, the way that we manufacture products, maybe not in large-scale factories, and then ship products across the ocean. So, mm -hmm. so hopefully 3D printing will help mm -hmm. catch up some of the um, transportation lag in, in globalization. Mm. Well, you know, you wrote a, I think, really interesting piece that was in the Press Citizen this week about uh, some of the sort of blessings, the wonderful um, possibilities with globalization, mm. particularly related to our state here, and uh, and then, you know, some of the challenges that, that could go either way, depending upon who you are and where you live. Um, uh, talk a little bit about what you think Iowa might uh, find yeah. as globalization becomes more and more and more an everyday reality. You know, um, I don't know much about I've lived outside of Iowa for the last 30 years, so I bring sort of an unencumbered perspective back to the state and have been amazed at, when I was home in, at Northwood, uh, went out to uh, um, an ethanol plant with a high school classmate who's a farmer, and he drove a semi-truck full of his corn harvest out to the ethanol plant. And as a kid, I remember um, hearing about, you know, barges from Dubuque and Davenport going down to New Orleans, and, and now Iowa consumes about half of its uh, corn crop by in, in, uh, in ethanol production. Mm -hmm. So if um, yesterday or the day before there was the announcement that DuPont is opening a cellulosic ethanol plant, uh, breaking ground on it in Nevada, Iowa. So if cellulosic ethanol, which can be made from sort of the stems of plants and, and uh, cellulosic fiber, um, wood chips, uh, recycled cardboard, switchgrass, et cetera. If technological advances in cellulosic um, ethanol make it competitive with grain-based ethanol, it means that Iowa's corn farmers will lose about half of their market because right now about half of the corn crop goes into ethanol. So people in Georgia and Alabama can grow poplars and softwood pine trees um, more economically than we can grow corn. Um, people in the, in the plain states can grow switchgrass and other um, perennial grasses. So Iowa needs to, to um, be cognizant of the fact that the, really the boom in our agro-industrial sector that we've seen in the last five or six years um, may be temporary, and we need to make sure that we have um, thought ahead far enough about the advent of cellulosic ethanol. Um, and in terms of our, you know, people think what, what, would Iowa's, what would Iowa's major largest export be? And we'd think corn or soybeans or pork. It really last year was tractors. And advanced manufacturing is one of the biggest, most important elements of Iowa's um, economy and particularly for exports. And to make sure that we have a, a workforce that's advanced enough to provide and large enough and skilled enough to provide those um, skills necessary to keep Iowa's advanced manufacturing exports among the most important in the state um, really is a challenge. And I think that the University of Iowa and Kirkwood Community College are the southeastern Iowa hub for the STEM education outreach program. I think some other people are going to be talking about, uh, you know, the needs for educating the workforce uh, to be mm -hmm. highly skilled, highly productive, and to make sure that Iowa's advanced manufacturing um, sector mm -hmm. can remain globally competitive. Right now we're doing very well. Iowa's population is stagnating, uh, it's old, we need to attract more new, new Iowans and make sure that they have the, the training to, to, to take uh, and to create um, high paying, uh, high skilled manufacturing jobs um, mm -hmm. to keep our economy strong. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, maybe a little common conversation here. You know, we've just gone through a uh, heated um, political debate, and um, it seems as though, as a nation, we have sort of a split personality when it comes to issues of, uh, about the rest of the world, you know? On the one hand, uh, we recognize that um, we are exporting many goods, and we're happy to have the income 
that comes back to, to the country. Um, there are many ways in which we are happy to recognize um, international visitors or workers in our country, but then at the same time, there is strange, uh, 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 many people just kind of close in once again and act as though our borders should be, uh, you know, fully, fully protected and closed. And what we are as Americans right now is what we need to be with sort of, sort of, um, limited influence from the outside world, whether we're talking about politics or we're just talking about our neighbors next door, it seems to me that we, we live in many spaces in our uh, communal heads here in this country. Do, do any of you uh, care to respond to that, Fred? Well, I think one of the important things to remember uh, is that uh, the effects of globalization are not even across all individuals, right? Mm -hmm. They're, not everyone living in the United States has the same experience or, or the same combination of benefits and, and drawbacks that result from globalization. Uh, so we shouldn't be terribly surprised that we're hearing voices coming from different directions because people's experiences are different. Mm -hmm. uh, the, biggest group of people who have uh, suffered from uh, globalization in the United States and elsewhere in uh, the rich countries of the world has been people who are relatively low skilled. Uh, and th that's not surprising because there's lots of people with relatively low skills around the world. And once you can uh, trade with them and, or invest in their countries, uh, that means that, that people living here are directly in competition with people elsewhere. And so uh, people who uh, are in that position quite naturally are going to say, well, this has been not good for me, and, and want to see, uh, mm -hmm. want to draw back, mm -hmm. right? Or, or harken back to a less globalized time and say mm -hmm. it was much better then. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think we should be surprised that, while on the one hand, uh, many of us enjoy lots of benefits from, from globalization, that other people are, mm -hmm. are, are more reticent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fred's points. Globalization, I think, asks us to be more active learners, and in particular, what is currently we are seeing at the University of Iowa campus as well as the state of Iowa with regard to the incoming Chinese students can be one model of that. Um, so we are um, now having about 500 or over 500 Chinese students who come to Iowa for their undergrad education every year. And then we are giving them, those who want liberal education, this very strong liberal education that this university can offer to them. And at the same time, we welcome them as internationalizers. For in, in other words, for Iowa students, they can show us what it's like to be in the other part of the world. But at the same time, here and there, I, we hear stories of um, how Chinese students um, do not find American friends, and then how they have a hard time adjusting to these new communities. And I also hear stories from American students, and they are struggling to adjust to this new environment. But um, if there is a little bit of active learning process involved, I think that that can be a very exciting um, place where globalization can be experienced um, around mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to talk just for a minute about cultural globalization and the, and the sharing of ideas. We saw how uh, the very instantaneous negative impact of the, um, the film, The Innocence of Muslims, and how it resulted in attacks on diplomatic uh, facilities uh, in, in North Africa and the Middle East. And so we think of that as sort of a negative aspect of uh, sort of the, the globalization of, of culture and ideas. But just before I came over here, I watched the music video Gangnam Style. <laughs> the Korean pop video that, is it, do, how many people have watched that now? How many is it? 900, 900 million or something? Million. The most watched pop video. And so people who like world music, who like 
to go to international restaurants and, uh, and mm -hmm. to enjoy the, I mean, Iowa City is really special and because we have, uh, because the university has uh, 3,500 um, international students, it really is more cosmopolitan and worldly than most other places in Iowa per capita. And mm -hmm. for those of us who enjoy that, it's a real plus to be, to be in Iowa City and to be in a university mm -hmm. environment. I can remember that, that you know, glo cultural glo globalization works both ways. Uh, not only do we see, um, get some of the benefits, but one of the negative aspects of it for me, when I, many years ago I was in Sudan and had gone down the Nile River and gotten off a train at a very isolated place, hiked out to some very uh, remote, um, unknown pyramids and spent the day sort of exploring these pyramids. And that night I slept in a little shelter house nearby and there were some other people camping there as well. And I went up a small hill and watched the moon rise over these pyramids. Just a fascinating uh, scene. A Sudanese guy uh, saw me and ran out of the sort of the shelter house up the hill and said, where are you from? And I said, uh, I'm from America. He said, oh, I have something for, to share with you. And he ran down the hill and I thought, hashish? You know, what's, what's he gonna come <laughs> up with? So he ran back up the hill and he had a cassette recorder and he said, this is for you. And he hit the button and out screeched the BG soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> Just completely demolished the ambiance of the moon rising over the, I wanted to take a rock and break his, his tape recorder. I listened, suffered through that the whole side of the Bee Gees uh, cassette. And then he popped out his cassette and rather than rewinding, he put it on a little stick and rewound it manually to save his battery. So that was a cultural yeah. learning for me to see him rewind that cassette without using a battery. Yeah. But I had to pay the cost of 45 minutes of Bee Gees music <laughs> uh, to hear it. So yeah. cultural, uh, the cultural globalization works both ways. And many yeah. people think that we're richer for it. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm one of those. Some mm -hmm. people still are struggling with that, but they, yeah. they need to get with it. Yeah. Well, it is interesting traveling, even if you only go so far as to travel to Western Europe, you know, uh, it is so strange now as opposed to say 25, 30 years ago within, within my lifetime, uh, all of the chains that we're familiar with uh, from Starbucks to McDonald's to whatever, of course they're commonplace in many parts of the world right now. And um, people all seem to dress in some sort of universal um, style these days. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were gonna say something, yeah. And uh, yeah, and uh, so I mean, there's something kind of nice about that and something uh, kind of strange too. And the other thing about the internet and the way we receive information these days, uh, an awful lot of what's on the internet is, is, has not been sort of verified independently by people. You, if you're not quite careful, you may be reading things that, that uh, you know, are absolutely inaccurate. And um, the other thing is, I, I perceive this as sort of a loss in, if you just imagine our own country's culture. Um, I remember a time when there were three networks and then eventually there was a PBS. And uh, there, there were sort of, uh, there was a small range of common experiences that we, that we might all share or choose not to take part in. But now it is very, very, very different. There's something for absolutely everybody's taste, and that's pretty cool, but it's also often not a common shared experience. Uh, yeah. Globalization sometimes challenges the authenticity mm -hmm. of unique locations, cultures, societies. And so, um, I've been, I think I've lived, worked, or traveled in 91 different countries. And if you ask me what's the most interesting place I've been to, I'd say Bhutan, a little Buddhist kingdom in the Himalayas. And it's so interesting because it hasn't been globalized. You don't see t-shirts and jeans and, and Nike sneakers, and you don't see music videos in, you know, in restaurants mm -hmm. and buses. Very, very uh, unique, um, isolated culture. And so I, I enjoy that. But if you ask the people of Bhutan, would they yeah. like yeah. Nike tennis shoes, you say, yeah, you bet, they're the best. Yeah. So, <laughs> not, uh, yeah. or, or other yeah. uh, sort of westernized products. So sometimes mm -hmm. um, the challenge is how do you maintain the best of sort of uh, indigenous or original cultures? And one might look at the Amana colonies. You know, they are a really unique part of Iowa. It was a unique uh, utopian experiment in Iowa that basically failed during the, during the Depression. And, uh, and yet the Amana colonies have transformed themselves in a way that still makes them econo economically viable mm -hmm. and an interesting part of the Iowa landscape. And so other places haven't been made that successful transition mm -hmm. that still keep the sort of authentic original roots character of, mm -hmm. of their history, their, their culture. And so it's a challenge that indigenous people are finding all around the world and, uh, worlds and many countries. Mm -hmm. um, and so one, 
one also sees the, you know, the Mennonite and Amish communities in Kelowna and elsewhere around Iowa, how they've managed to maintain their cultural identity, their communities, their religious uh, um, cohesion in, in the midst of rapidly globalizing Iowa. It's really kind of interesting. Before we break from this segment, I'd I just like to um, ask one more question about um, the, well, the, the challenge, really, of um, being an authentic individual in the 21st century. I, I think that's a, I take this from your last point about retaining authentic culture. I, I fear sometimes that we all um, bleed into one another in a way that we are, and maybe this is something for people who study mass psychology, but you know, something starts in one place very small. It may come from nothing, a, a non-incident, which becomes then something that, that um, sparks um, an action or an activity, it really takes on tremendous uh, proportions, often negative, but I suppose they could also be positive. And I, and I wonder about the, the sort of, um, the, the, the way in which we communicate in the current world, is that, is that uh, presenting a real problem for us as, as individuals and independent thinkers? I mean, do you, do you think there's anything to that, Jian? So actually, while um, Ron, you were talking about this authenticity, I was um, thinking about a totally different kind of examples. In, for example, the virtual migrants. For example, a group of people live um, as a group that adopts um, the culture and the lifestyle of a totally different nation while they are living in another country. So for example, mm -hmm. the Indian call center workers they use, right. they live as if they are residents of Chicago, Detroit, mm -hmm. and they have their um, American names. So, and for cultural reasons, some people decide to um, consume Japanese um, anime, and then their cultural reference is not of that of US or Korea, but mm -hmm. of Japan. So I think it challenges us, our assumption of nationality. We mm -hmm. tend to assume that we, we know our national people because I'm part of it, but at the same time, it challenges us to rethink that assumption and then probably every step is um, somewhat conscious acknowledgement or um, effort to understand and to be a little more tolerable. Mm -hmm. But when we have that attitude, I think that there can be much less um, yeah. threats of globalization and then a little more excitement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think that the, the you, you've, and the, our conversation has raised a, a couple of uh, really important points. Again, that uh, I think the example of the, 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 the three television networks sort of exploding and, and, and once ha everyone was watching the same thing and had that in common. Uh, well, at the same time, we, we have, on, on the one hand, we have this explosion of options uh, explosion of ways that we might define ourselves and find our own authentic, uh, our, our own individual authenticity. While at the same time, you were also uh, pointing up the, the fact that so often, so many people end up in the same place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Wearing their jeans and their and their sneakers and their t-shirts. Uh, so I think that there's again these 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 cross-cutting pressures that there's more opportunity than ever before uh, for at least some people to. Uh, sample the, all that people around the world have to offer to <laughs> enrich uh, our lives. And, and at, but there's also the cost is, does it, does it uh, somehow create more uniformity? Mm -hmm. uh, the example of the TV stations would say no. It, now mm -hmm. the, the, the myth that uh, we as a nation all share the same uh, experiences and, and, and same preferences. Your, your point is really good with Fred. One that it's a challenge to strike a balance that many Iowa communities face now, particularly that have in the last 10 years seen an influx of uh, Spanish speaking uh, members of their community, school systems are bilingual. Uh, many of the, of the communities are struggling to how to how to integrate people whose culture and language and, and life experiences is different. So I grew up in a town that was largely Norwegian Lutheran, and the old farmers that came in at, 
you know, on Saturday night downtown, could speak Norwegian to each other, but their grandsons and daughters in my grade couldn't. So the real challenge is how do you integrate and assimilate non-English speaking new Iowans to make them have every educational opportunity and employment opportunity to be able to add value to our state and its culture and economy while maintaining some of that cultural richness that they can bring. So it's a balance. It can't be at one end of the spectrum or the other. There needs to be uh, an assimilation while they are able to maintain cultural elements of their background and heritage that they can rightfully be proud of. So the Norwegian immigrants that came to Northwood, Iowa, a long time ago, wanted to completely assimilate, and they did so by not teaching their children, grandchildren Norwegian. And we've lost that uh, mm -hmm. to a large degree. So the challenge for new immigrants is to assimilate quickly while retaining that uh, element of their cultural background that can add richness to Iowa. Mm -hmm. And so Fred's mm -hmm. point is a complex one, and how you do that is really tough. And mm -hmm. so we'll look to people like Fred to help us through that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much. I've been listening to Ron McMullen, to Jian Kang, and to Fred Solt. Please give our guests a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to introduce our next guest now. Uh, Terry Bowles is a UI Associate Professor of Management and Organizations and the Director of the Institute for International Business at the UI's Tippy College of Business. And John Bloomhall is President and Chief Executive Officer of Diamond V Mills Incorporated, a producer of animal feed ingredients that are marketed worldwide. The company is headquartered in Cedar Rapids and has wholly owned subsidiaries in China and in Mexico. International sales offices are in the Netherlands and in Thailand. Uh, so welcome. And uh, John, let me begin with you. Um, since its in inception, your family's business has been in Cedar Rapids, headquartered there. Uh, and uh, d tell us a little bit about the history of your family's involvement with this business. I'd be happy to. Thank you, Joan. Um, <clears throat> my grandfather was born in 1885 in North Dakota. And obviously, there wasn't any refrigeration in those days. And a common practice was to whatever leftover milk you and the cow produced that day, and whatever food you did not eat, you let it ferment, and then you'd feed it to the animals. And my grandfather made an observation uh, while growing up, living on the farm, that the animals always did better when they had a fermentation product in, in their feed. So he kind of tucked that in the back of his mind and went to, to work for actual like George Douglas, who was quite an industrialist in Cedar Rapids. He, was, he and his brothers were one of the original founders of Quaker Oats and then started Douglas Starch Works, which turned into Pennock and Ford, and which is now Penford Products, still in operations. Mm -hmm. But he worked for uh, George Douglas for many years, and he retired at age 58. And he decided to start a company at that point in time to make a fermentation product go into animal feeds. And so he started Diamond V. It was 1943. He lived through the Depression. Uh, it, he was 58 years old, and, and I'm 59, and so I just don't know if I'd have the energy to start a, a business at, at his age, but he did. And so he started Diamond V and, in 1943. And he made one decision that still guides us today, and that was that we would not compete with our customers. So our sole focus has been on our fermentation technology, and that has led in, us uh, into global markets today, and we do business around the world. Yeah, 45 or more countries, I understand. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit before the program, and as I understand it, all of the things you produce are produced here in Iowa. Uh, at the moment, you don't have any production plants in any other part of the world. Correct. Yeah. Um, we protect our intellectual property by as trade secrets, and so uh, we manufacture everything in, in Iowa. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think this is a terrific example of an Iowa-started business, and um, one that still employs Iowans. You have a big research facility, and uh, I think two separate plants in Cedar Rapids, yeah. one in Ankeny, and, um, I, and then you have offices, I know, in the Netherlands, also in Mexico, um, and China, as well. Yep. Yeah, so, so here you are, an Iowa company, and you are doing business all over the world. How long have you been involved internationally? Uh, our first international business started in 1962, but it was very opportunistic. It was uh, a company in Italy had heard about our product and wanted to import it and be, our, be a distributor in, in Italy, and, and so we started to uh, uh, sell product in Italy in 1962. Japan followed after that in about 1970. Mm -hmm. 
and it really wasn't until I took over as CEO, uh, I'm sorry, when, when my brother preceded me and we started expanding our international markets back at the, the end of the late 80s through exclusive distribution on an international basis. Mm -hmm. When I became CEO and we looked uh, at the global markets, it's important to understand how food is produced and some of the numbers associated with, with food production. The entire world's food supply is produced on approximately 2 to 3 percent of the surface of the earth. We know 80 percent of it's covered with water, right? And, but the, the, our, all of our meat, milk, eggs, and cereal grains are produced on the only about 2 to 3 percent of, of the surface of the earth. Global populations are growing from 7 to 9 billion people by the year 2050. Where's that growth going to occur? About 49 percent of that growth is going to occur on the continent of Africa. Approximately 42 percent of the, the growth is going to occur in China and Southeast Asia. North America's population will grow by approximately 4 percent, South America by about 7 percent, and Europe is actually projected to contract by about 1 percent. So we have to move food and we have to double the amount of food we produce. And 70 percent of that doubling is going to come from the adaption of technology. And so as we look at those international and global markets, we look at feeding the world. Mm -hmm. and, and the other aspect of growing world populations is developing countries. Mm -hmm. Once people start getting a, above $2 a day in income, the first thing they spend it on after a cell phone <laughs> is, is better food. They want to eat more meat protein instead of plant protein. Mm -hmm. And so those two dynamics of population growth and increasing mm -hmm. uh, living conditions mm -hmm. around the world in underdeveloped countries are going to drive the need to, to, to yeah. make a lot more food in the world. So when you, when you and your board of directors, you decide to, to uh, go perhaps into a new area where you haven't been before, what are the main challenges? Do you look at the governments involved? Do you look at um, uh, how you're going to communicate through marketing? What, what are your main concerns? Uh, obviously, government is a big thing we, we look at. Uh, and. We have a very strong core value system inside of our, our company, and so we actually embrace the diversity of different cultures, and, and so we like to go into a market with national employees. We don't send Americans there. Americans don't always adapt very well to uh, other cultures quite as well as other cultures adapt. And so we use nationals primarily, and we look at the government and uh, situations like can we protect our technology, what, what are the economics in that particular market and how does, it, does that work, and then, then we go from there. In fact, China and Mexico were our first two markets that we opened our own companies with, and they've been wildly successful for us. And I, I believe you told me that uh, to date, all of the products are all produced here and you transport them to places like China. But somewhere in the future, you may be thinking, assuming you can get that uh, protection of your trade secrets Correct. in Look, hand. We've invested in technology and, and some innovation that we could manufacture and protect our mm -hmm. technology, we believe, on a global basis. But we do manufacture everything today in Iowa and ship it around the world, which includes China. We probably, mm -hmm. We're probably shipping 25 to 35 containers a month to, to China mm -hmm. nowadays. That's our yeah. largest growth market. Yeah. It's been very successful for us. And uh, one last question. Do you uh, serve mostly large farming operations or individual small farmers? Uh, all of them. All of them. We, we really do. We have relationships, obviously, with large companies as well as large producers. But we also have relationships with smaller, mm -hmm. too, and, and our product is used, used completely throughout the, the systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know how to ask this question delicately, but I, I will just, first of all, compliment you, thank you, really, for keeping your operation here in Iowa. Was there, is there ever any reason for an organization like yours to, to move out of a state like ours and go to a coast or, uh, you know? Uh, you know, we looked at, when we, we built a second manufacturing facility after the flood of 2008. 
And when we, we build it, we looked at building it in Europe. And uh, quite truthfully, by the time we did all the economic analysis, we could have built it in Cedar Rapids and operate it, make our product, and ship it to Europe faster than we could have done it if we would have built it and operated hmm. it in Europe. Yeah, so, yeah. But we, we'll do what's right. Yeah, right. Well, thank you. So, John Blumhall. And now I'm going to turn for a second to uh, Terry Bowles. And, uh, Terry, you've been teaching in the College of Business for quite a long time, and, and you're also... Uh, in charge of an international aspect of teaching in the College of uh, Business. Tell us a little bit about the program you have there to train students who are going out into the you know, marketplace. Well, I started thinking about when I first came to the University of Iowa, and that was 93, and uh, making a case that we should be offering you know, more international courses mm -hmm. and giving our students more international opportunities. And there was a real hesitation to take a big step like that. And I, I'm proud to say that we've, we've changed a lot in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, more and more of our students are studying internationally or at least having the opportunity to go on uh, short courses and trips like that. Um, the institute that I direct at the at the uh, Papa John building and the Tippy College is called the Institute for International Business. And we've tried to slip in more and more opportunities for international education for our students, primarily through grants that we've written through the Department of Education, Business and International Education. And one of the things that came out of one of these grants was the, uh, the establishment of what we call the International Perspectives Program. And this program is uh, designed to encourage students to double major in business and language. So we work with the Department of World Languages. Uh, there's a challenge to do a full-time major in both departments. Yeah. Um, so it's a small group, but we're really proud of them. And we started that uh, four years ago. And they, the first group is going to graduate uh, this year. Mm -hmm. And we, they are all required to do a, a study abroad. And we support them in, by paying for their airfare in a mm -hmm. small way that we can, can help them. Mm -hmm. um, I'll stop there, but there's many other things that are going on that you yeah. might want to know about. Yeah. Well, I know that throughout the university, and certainly my home department, International Programs, is involved in um, intercultural training and, and uh, uh, trying to put um, people together with both new students, new faculty, new TAs, um, to, to help them work through some of the challenges of having a very international campus. I know that there is a big effort within the College of Business to, um, to help with some of what you just mentioned, John. Sometimes Americans aren't as uh, adaptable or aware of the kinds of things that uh, might be perceived differently in another country from the way they're perceived in the States. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of that cultural training? Well, actually, I want to talk about the influx of Chinese mm -hmm. students, as, as, as we heard before, there's about 500 new students coming a year from China, and 200 of those are in the College of Business. Yeah. So that's provided us with uh, opportunities and challenges, but it has also given our domestic students a chance to learn a lot uh, without, without even venturing outside of Iowa City. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working now to sort of promote mutual understanding so that they aren't them and us, mm -hmm. and uh, find some, some common ground, uh, partnering like a buddy system with the new, new incoming Chinese students. We're starting that mm -hmm. on a small scale. Mm -hmm. We also brought out a consultant, actually, to work with our faculty and staff in understanding um, the challenges that we have with the Chinese students and some of their different uh, values, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a, a fun and different avenue than yeah. I thought I would be doing. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Well, I know that you've also developed an online course for uh, um, international business. Uh, can talk a little bit about that. Yes, this course actually came out of a grant from International Programs uh, Provost Office. They had a Strategic Initiatives Award, and we decided that one of the things we'd like to do is offer a course on on global, global trade, and we are now offering that through continuing education um, in the entrepreneurship program, and it's called Entrepreneurship and Global Trade. And this course is um, designed to, to prepare students to know how to export, uh, so that we have people, Iowa is a huge exporting state, and 
I think we need to educate more students in, in understanding the logistics of that. Mm -hmm. So it's actually being taught, um, co-taught, by two uh, business people who are involved in international trade themselves. And we're in the third semester of offering that program, and it's been very successful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, John, in your uh, business community in Cedar Rapids, um, I, I know that you sit on a lot of boards. You're a very, very active uh, participant in community um, affairs. Uh, what level of international work is going on with Cedar Rapids companies? Well, C Cedar Rapids is very active internationally. We have Rockwell there, yeah. uh, obviously. Uh, we have ADM and Cargill there, uh, ourselves there. Mm -hmm. And so there is a significant amount of international activity mm -hmm. in Cedar Rapids. Yeah, yeah, and I take it business people help one another, sort of mentor one another as, uh, some of these, as long as you're this not is Iowa. Doing the same yeah, thing. You know, uh, <laughs> it, it's amazing how yeah. helpful other yeah. businesses are to, to help facilitate. Yeah newer businesses at International. Right. Well, I, there's a recently organized uh, organization called uh, International Traders of Iowa, and I went to one of their presentations where um, two business people from Cedar Rapids were talking about uh, operations that they had and endeavors that they were trying to start in Thailand and in other parts of um, Southeast Asia. And um, the kinds of things they were talking about were uh, really cultural and business practice issues rather than understanding what the actual laws were what the regulations were. It was all about who should you talk to first, when should you have a, make a visit to um, an, an official in the government, uh, is there a local personage you need to speak to first. And, and it was very interesting to hear them talk about some false starts that they had made and um, how important it was for people thinking of going into another culture, another part of the world, to, to really um, invest a lot of time and to spend some time on the ground before they um, make too many assumptions about how much they know about their place they're going to be working. Does that sound about right? <laughs> yes, that's a very important uh, part of being a, a good international business person. Uh, we, in the global trade class, and, and I also teach negotiations and uh, talk about global negotiations and how important it is to know something about the culture before you go in. We mm -hmm. Americans make uh, terrible faux pas sometimes in assuming that everything is done the way we do business just because we're so successful at it. Um, so we talk about issues like um, when in Rome do you do as the Romans do or uh, do you uh, take your own value systems over there? Mm -hmm. uh, in the Let global me ask trade. you a question about that. What's, what's the answer what's to that? What's the answer to that? <laughs> you know, it depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, most American companies that are strong um, hold to their own value systems and, and ethics when they're practicing mm -hmm. overseas. I think there's temptations sometimes for smaller businesses who are trying to get their foot in the door to uh, perhaps bribe or mm -hmm. use uh, slush payments to, to get in and that... Mm -hmm that can cause some problems. We talk a lot about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which used to, I think uh, 20 years ago, didn't seem to have much teeth in it, but now um, you're seeing a lot of companies prosecuted for violating that act. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. important that we educate our business students to understand their responsibilities in that domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we heard in the prior segment Ron McMullen talk about uh, some changes in, potentially in our economy related to some of the things we grow and produce in this state over the next many years. Um, what's your feeling, a businessman looking for the, the next generation to carry on after you've finished your work with Diamond V Mills? Um, what do you think is the most important thing for your, your successor to think about? I think uh, to, to think of the world as a global market place, no matter what we're doing, simply because of the internet and communications now, we live in a global market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's the biggest thing mm -hmm. I think we have to keep mm -hmm. in mind mm -hmm. going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, anything further you'd like to say here, Terry, about uh, best advice for students just going out into that global marketplace? Well, one of the things I would encourage is that they learn the language. Uh, even, even if you're not fluent in another language, trying to uh, at least be able to understand the, the way things are done and say hello and mm -hmm. introduce yourself. That, it goes a long way. I, mm -hmm. I remember uh, attending a, 
a talk by an engineer from John Deere some time ago over in the engineering department, and it was full of uh, fresh faces about, oh, this is something I really want to do. And, uh, and the question they asked is, well, what's the best thing I can do to prepare myself uh, to be in the global marketplace a success? And the answer was, learn Chinese. Hmm. And I, I think that's good advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a big thank you to John Bloomhall and Terry Bulls. Thank you so much for sharing the evening with us. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this is World Canvas from International Programs. I'm Joan Kerr. We invite you to join us as a member of the audience for our next program on January 25th, when the topic is the rupture of civil war. All World Canvas programs are broadcast on the Hawkeye Network, Iowa Public Radio, and KRUI-FM. They can be accessed anywhere in the world through iTunes and the Public Radio Exchange. Um, I'm inviting our next guest to join us now. Marcella David is just here next to me, and uh, Shelton Stromquist is uh, coming on stage, and Jennifer Scherer um, is Maya Steinitz here, uh, perhaps later. Um, well, Marcella, I, I will start with you as a faculty member in the um, College of Law, also Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law. You teach law and international studies. Um, give us a little bit of insight into how the College of Law prepares students for what comes next after they graduate. Well, when we're thinking about preparing students for uh, a global perspective on the legal profession, we offer a number of different things. In terms of courses, um, we have a very strong curriculum. There are a number of colleagues that I have, some of whom are international themselves, who teach topics related to public law, how nations relate to each other, as well as private law, how private citizens might govern transactions, might govern their private relations mm -hmm. with each other, including trade and finance and business and all sorts of different topics. Um, we are also very excited to welcome into our community, as Terry was describing in the College of Business, people who are bringing perspectives that have been formed in other legal um, systems. So we have a very thriving visiting scholars program where um, people will come for short periods of time, long periods of time. We have someone, um, actually some Chinese scholars who came and have fallen in love with Iowa City and are planning to stay not <laughs> six months, but a year in six months. So um, they're really great uh, people to interact with for faculty members, mm -hmm. for students. Um, I agree with Terry that sometimes it's challenging to get our students to actually engage in the more meaningful way, and that's mm -hmm. something that we always have to work on. Um, and then, of course, we try and send our students out through study abroad programs that will give them an opportunity to learn about a different legal uh, culture and to experience the world and get some of that cultural grounding that will make them feel a little bit more Mm -hmm. um, um, confident mm -hmm. in their international reactions. Mm -hmm. And when students come and talk to me, I tell them that as future policymakers, as future practitioners, having a global perspective on the law is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And I usually give them two or three examples, and I'll bore you with them. <laughs> um, but for example, um, we've heard about international businesses that are operating in Iowa. John Deere is not quite in Iowa, but we'll kind of claim it because it's just across the river. <laughs> and uh, we were talking with some lawyers there, uh, and they, when they are uh, sending a combine to um, an agricultural country in Europe, for example, mm -hmm. um, they have to understand about how to get it there, how to negotiate the contract how to get the money from here to there or from there to here. Um, they have to understand um, what kind of safety guards are going to be required um, to protect people operating the machines that are going to be different there than they are here. They have to understand the labor laws that are going to be different there than they are here and how to make that harmonization that will make the entire project worthwhile. And so that's an example on uh, a business side of how having that awareness, enough of an awareness to spot the issues, to spot the potential pitfalls is really important to being successful in advising someone at John Deere or Cargill or at Rockwell Collins. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if you want to talk about personal matters, um, there's actually a case that's being argued um, this past week in the Supreme Court on family law, international family law. And if I recall it correctly, it was a U.S. service person who was stationed in Germany was in London, met and fell in love with someone from Scotland who was in London. They got married, um, produced a child. He went back to Germany. She went back to Scotland, which, where uh, her parents could help her support 
and raise her, um, their daughter. And then um, when he finished his tour, they reunited in Alabama where, of course, things fell terribly apart in the marriage. It was just mm -hmm. in... Oops, sorry. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so when you think about the custody issues, yeah. uh, the divorce occurs in Alabama after they're only there for a short time. The mother and the daughter want to split. She wants to go back to her support base, which is Scotland, which is the place where this child has had most of her upbringing. Um, the father wants the child to stay in Alabama because that's going to be close to him and his family and his culture. How do you reconcile that? And that's just a very simple issue that is coming up more and more and more mm -hmm. as you see people traveling around the world and making these kinds of international connections. Right, right. So it sort of sounds like there isn't any kind of law you could pursue an interest in without having the need to know something about countries beyond our own. I tell students that if they're interested in learning about international law, their first start is to understand our legal system mm -hmm. and then understand how it compares to other legal systems and fits into them and mm -hmm. how those issues can impact across a broad range the various things that they're going to try to accomplish for their clients. Right, right, right. And so then there are, there's the, the sort of, um, I know you have people like Adrian Wing in uh, the the international uh, mm -hmm. part of the law school, and she's very uh, she has worked. I think Maya Steinitz also has on um, emerging governments, uh, creating their constitutions, creating documents for their countries uh, that uh, whether they pull things from our own constitution or whether they just need uh, a well-rounded um, uh, you know consultant to get this going. This is another area, this whole area of politics, um, uh, human rights, uh, very, very important area to study. And I, I imagine this is a growing area in the College of Law? I don't think it's a growing area. That's actually fairly consistent because um, for good or bad, um, countries seem to um, fall apart or transition or need to create a new government, and that's something that has happened in the past and will happen in the future. I think we're more sophisticated now in the kinds of ways that we approach um, helping new governments or transitioning governments um, create structures that are going to be mm -hmm sufficient to support their efforts going forward. Um, I'm really pleased because in the past, Adrian Wing has actually taken students with her and they've been able to help develop those mm -hmm. kinds of, of, of conversations where people are talking about um, how do you take uh, human rights, uh, how do you take government structures and adapt them to a local culture so that you're not putting in place something that's a square peg and it's not mm -hmm. going to fit particularly mm -hmm. well in a, in a round hole. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that we're more sophisticated about that. Um, but, but it is true that I think as, as we become more sophisticated, we're thinking about it more deliberately um, and proactively, and, mm -hmm. and that might be the reason why it seems like it's happening more yeah. as yeah. opposed to happening more maybe effectively or more noticeably. Mm -hmm. um, but I think another area, and this is an area that I've talked with some folks around campus about, where we see these kinds of issues coming together in a public policy mode is, is with regard to disasters. Oh, yeah. Um, where um, nowadays, if you think of Haiti, if you think of um, what's going on in, in some of the other uh, countries in the Caribbean that have been devastated by floods recently. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of what's going on in Afghanistan as they're rebuilding, and the same thing in Iraq, there are non-governmental organizations that are wielding much more influence than governments do, than um, ambassadors in USAID might be wielding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and figuring out uh, and a lot of those organizations are run by lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things mm -hmm. we like to do. Um, <laughs> we believe we can save the world. <laughs> and figuring out how to do that, not just from the prism of law, but mm -hmm. from a prism that also takes into account political science perspectives, sociological, anthropological uh, perspectives, um, medical perspectives, health perspectives, cultural mm -hmm. perspectives, so you can put in place something that will actually be helpful and something that will actually have more legs to it than when mm -hmm. you're just there dispensing money and smiling and everybody's smiling back at you. Yeah. That's really important, and, and trying to get people to think about that is, is, is a new direction. I think the university can, in an interdisciplinary fashion, uh, embrace. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Thank you so much. Uh, well, I think I'll move now to our next two guests, uh, Shelton Stromquist and Jennifer Scherer. And um, from the two of you, I'm hoping we can get a, a little bit of first historical perspective and then a little bit of contemporary perspective on labor issues related to globalization. Um, and Shell, you're in the history department, and um, I've asked you to sort of take the lead on giving us this long perspective. Well, thanks, uh, John. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I find myself as a historian uh, in these contexts talking about globalization, uh, wanting to say, well, wait a minute, this is, this is not new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've, uh, we've seen globalization in one form or another for a very long time, literally centuries. Um, and, um, and I think it's important that we understand it in that longer historical context, in part because we're living with the consequences of that mm -hmm. history um, as they've evolved and played out. Um, I mean, one can certainly talk about uh, the kind of early expansion of Europe into what we came to call the third world mm -hmm. um, and the colonization that occurred and the structures of inequality, economic inequality that were embedded in those societies and their, and their, uh, their economies. And uh, uh, to a very large extent, um, at least for, uh, for from decades, if not centuries, um, those patterns of inequality um, persisted. And even with decolonization, you had, um, you had countries that were struggling to um, create some kind of balance in their economies mm -hmm. that were not inherently there as they had developed. I lived, this is going back quite a long ways, um, in East Africa and Tanzania for a couple of years. Um, and uh, it was so profoundly troubling that this very um, um, eager and newly um, independent country was struggling to create a foundation for its economic growth that it might actually control when all of the products that it had to sell in the world were world market were raw materials whose prices were falling and they were having to buy manufactured goods uh, whose prices were rising and they were caught in this in this kind of perpetual squeeze that uh, just deprived them of the resources that they needed yeah. to be able uh, to develop effectively um, and and one other aspect of this kind of longer term history and you know I could, mm -hmm. could go on at, at length is this the the notion that um, labor has um, has migrated um, and has been migratory um, across national boundaries even before there were nations to mm -hmm. define their boundaries. Um, and this, uh, this kind of transnational movement of workers in response to changing labor market conditions um, has obviously fueled economic development, but has also been a source of real exploitation and of uh, deprivation. Um, I mean, we certainly have seen in this country literally generations of immigrants coming to our shores um, who provided the, the raw labor mm -hmm. for American industrialization, uh, very often at, at very low wages with very little opportunity to protect their, uh, their livelihoods through collective organization because of the hostility to, to mm -hmm. unions that was kind of endemic uh, in, in uh, many periods. Um, and, you know, we're now obviously living in a new stage, a new phase of this kind of transnational migration. Um, uh, whole new sets of migrants displaced from countries and from uh, societies that are undergoing kind of powerful transitions mm -hmm. that are creating enormous hardship. What's different today is that the borders are to a large extent compared to the past closed. Mm -hmm. um, and workers now find themselves in you know, displaced from their home communities, either as refugees, economic or political mm -hmm. refugees, or simply as people aspiring to a, a better life, but unable to move freely in this global economy because mm -hmm. the restrictions are so fair, so so severe. At least, not able to move legally uh, yeah. uh, in this global economy. So, when you introduce labor into the discussion of globalization, I'm afraid, um, at least from my perspective, mm -hmm. you introduce. Um, a, uh, a more pessimistic and a more uh, complicated story. Mm -hmm. it's, not, uh, it's not been a happy one in, yeah. in many respects, and I think uh, it's important for us to bear in mind. You know, I was 
many of you probably saw yesterday's New York Times, um, the, the uh, stories that are coming out about the tragic fire in Bangladesh, uh, where 112 uh, workers in a clothing factory were, were killed, uh, reminiscent very much of the Triangle Shirtwaist mm -hmm. Fire in New York City in 1911, just barely 100 years ago. Um, and, and the fact that it's now becoming clear that this was a firm that was producing um, a significant portion of its product for Walmart, mm -hmm. and that Walmart, now the documents reveal, had set conditions uh, in terms of price that made it uh, problematic to introduce the kind of safety um, uh, regulation that was necessary to prevent this kind of tragedy. And uh, unfortunately, this, this story is, is more widespread than we would imagine, mm -hmm. I think, sitting where we sit, um, and that firms like Walmart are in mm -hmm. fact setting the terms for labor in the supplier countries. The, mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk now about supply chains, and Walmart and other, other big retailers are of a profound force in holding down the opportunity for workers to improve their livelihoods in these uh, in these circumstances. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's uh, labor faces a real a real challenge in mm -hmm. this um, in this phase of globalization. Mm -hmm. Let's call it. Um, and uh, there's a lot of suffering, and mm -hmm. and not only suffering in other countries, but the Im impact of deindustrialization on our own communities has been profound. The relocation of capital uh, outside of Iowa mm -hmm. and other um, mm -hmm. communities that had depended and had built up industries like we just heard in Cedar mm -hmm. Rapids, mm -hmm. um, suddenly finding th th those workers who had committed years of their lives um, to these firms uh, displaced and unable to uh, enjoy anything like the standard mm -hmm. of living they had had before. So um, I hate to introduce such a <laughs> <laughs> sour perspective, but uh, you know when one looks at it from the perspective of labor, there's a lot of there's a lot of hardship and a lot yeah. of tragedy um, yeah. associated with globalization. Well, one other um, vexing um, element is child labor. That yeah. uh, regardless of of um, you know, there may be rules in one nation, but it doesn't mean that they apply to everyone. And, and right. of course, there, I think we all know that child labor is a, is a big, big, big issue in many parts of the developing world. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the export life of those various countries relies upon child mm -hmm. labor. Right, right. Well, and, and um, you know, child labor was, a, was an important part of our own history right, uh, right, and the history right. of Europe. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a kind of standard narrative about child labor, which uh, suggests that it's a passing phase mm -hmm. of industrialization, that it's a tragic and sorry uh, period, but that economies as they grow will gradually um, divest themselves of their, <laughs> their child laborers, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that uh, as standard of livings rise and children can be sent to school, and. Um, you know, the taken out of the factories, that this is, you know, there's a kind of natural development. Mm -hmm. um, and the work that I've done and that some of my colleagues with the Center for Human Rights have done on child labor, this is going back a few years, um, suggests that uh, not only in terms of our own histories in the United States and, and in Europe, but also in, certainly in the third world, that there's a kind of persistence of child labor, a kind of, um, uh, it's a more difficult um, problem to, to, to solve mm -hmm. than we might think. And part of it, just briefly, I think, is that um, many children are employed these days in third world countries, and even in the United States as well, in what we would call the informal sector, that is not in the formal manufacturing mm -hmm. sector. Um, and yet, because children's labor is available in the informal sector, it's possible for formal sector employees to pay very low wages, mm -hmm. and for families, therefore, to have to depend on their children going out into this informal sector mm -hmm. to do all kinds of work to support family livelihood. And families, indeed, feel constrained to withdraw their children, even if they could, mm -hmm. from this labor, because they need that income. Right. The opportunities for a self-sustaining income in the formal sector just mm -hmm. aren't there. And so, you know, until we begin to address the problems of low wages mm -hmm. and poor working conditions that adults are facing in the formal sector in the third world, there's not really going to be a serious solution, I think, to the problem of child labor mm -hmm. uh, because it's deeply intertwined. Hmm. 
Thank you. Um, well, Jennifer Scherer, let's go to you. You direct the University of Iowa Labor Center. And um, maybe you can begin by telling us what the, the Labor Center does. What is your mission? Sure. <clears throat> and thank you for having mm -hmm. me. Um, the Labor Center is part of the Division of Continuing Education at the university. And uh, four of us there are labor educators. And I would say really have the privilege of working closely with workers all over the state um, in a range of industries. and. Um, I feel like that gives us a perspective that in some ways would uh, uh, lead me to echo some of what Shell said about sort of the, you know, the visible human consequences in some cases of um, deindustrialization in Iowa, the loss of, loss of manufacturing jobs, and their re replacement to the extent that uh, new jobs are created, typically with um, jobs that pay less, with fewer benefits. Um, but I think also, uh, uh, would like to inject a bit of a hopeful perspective um, because I think uh, certainly at the time I've worked at the Labor Center um, and had uh, the opportunity to um, see uh, people really developing and workers across Iowa um, thinking, you know, being keenly aware for on the one hand of their connections to the global economy, um, which are hard to ignore. Uh, people certainly know where the products they produce are uh, being exported to. Um, they're certainly keenly aware of the kinds of um, uh, competition and loss of leverage um, that uh, we really started out discussing in the first segment when you spoke with Fred. Um, uh, and I think have also begun to develop um, ways of thinking about um, strategies for addressing that. Um, whether in the labor movement that has meant um, uh, really intensive, conscious efforts to intervene in policy debates um, about how to level the playing field, um, about how to improve labor standards, not just in our own country, but in other countries, um, and also how to build bridges with workers in other countries. Um, there's certainly many um, sort of promising examples of ways in which uh, unions have um, tried to connect with um, sister unions um, across borders, in part just to form human connections, but also to think strategically about the fact that uh, unless we raise standards for workers elsewhere, um, we're going to continue to feel those downward pressures um, on wages and working conditions here in our own state. Um, and, uh, you know, Shell also mentioned the increasing focus and understanding um, of the relationship between um, different parts of the globe in terms of the global supply chain. Um, and I think we're seeing really interesting examples um, domestically right now about uh, whether it's uh, people in temporary positions, in contingent uh, positions, um, trying to organize for better uh, working conditions uh, by understanding their position in the supply chain and how they do have um, leverage. Mm -hmm. Can I add something really Please. quickly? Mm -hmm. I used to um, represent the university and the Worker Rights Consortium, which is an organization that uh, tries to monitor U university and co collegiate logoed goods and where they're being manufactured. And one of the things that, that we've learned is that, you know, we think about um, um, jobs going to China or jobs going to um, some country and, and, and kind of staying there. And we went on a, a tour to learn more about what's going on in the garment industry. And we went to Thailand, and then we went to Cambodia. And the people in Thailand were talking about how Cambodia decided they were going to enter into the market and um, got the newest and bestest equipment and cut their prices for their labor and made a cheaper bid so they were stealing stuff from Thailand. And mm -hmm. Thailand had previous to that stolen it from someplace else. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, um, the globalization issue is really something that we kind of look at in a binary fashion, but it's really not a binary fashion. It's, it's very, very um, multifaceted, and that makes it even harder to try and correct some of the problems that are being raised, because when you sit there and you try and work with people in Thailand to help them raise their working standards, they might just be getting going, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden the work is not there anymore. It's in an entirely new place. And since Marcella mentioned the Worker Rights Consortium, which I think the university ought to be very proud to have become a member of, um, you know, they've been very prominent um, in responding to the uh, aftermath of the Bangladeshi fire, and I think sort of exemplify 
um, the important work that NGOs and other groups are doing, but also how difficult it is, how difficult and complex it is to solve these problems. <clears throat> and I know, uh, you know, Worker Rights Consortium spokespeople have been explaining um, that, uh, you know, it, it in some ways um, was not a surprise that this kind of tragedy would take place, um, that ongoing meetings with uh, transnational, um, uh, in some cases, U.S.-based brands like Walmart have been raising, you know, trying to raise consciousness about this uh, safety hazard um, and the unwillingness of brands to commit to making the changes necessary and putting forth the minimal in, in relation mm -hmm. to their overall profits um, amount of funding necessary to make those improvements mm -hmm. or to require those improvements of the supplier. Uh, but, you know, the layers of that supply chain and the constant shifting right. of production mm -hmm. um, makes that an, a huge and ongoing challenge. Yeah, I mean, I think responses that I saw in the in the New York Times, I don't have direct knowledge of it myself, was that uh, Walmart, in fact, has established some monitoring system of its own, but the problem appears to be, among other things, that they subcontract, and mm -hmm. those subcontractors subcontract, mm -hmm. and so that the the the, the complexity of the supply chain mm -hmm. has only gotten greater, and the ability to police and to monitor and to regulate mm -hmm. has also gotten more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, you you mentioned this um, uh, uh, desire to sort of have some kind of global solidarity in terms of organizing workers and so on. Um, I look at our own country, and this is a time of low union membership, and. Um, Perhaps in this last election, there was uh, the unions uh, would be happy with the result. I know that in certain districts, the unions are given some credit for having turned out the vote and so on. But um, we do live in a time where I think unions have a very different uh, image than they may have 35 years ago in terms of actually providing positive results for their own workers. Or uh, can you tell us something about about uh, the union situation in America just now, Shell? Well, uh, uh, Jen, Jen should jump in here, mm. too, because she works on a daily basis, basis yeah. with trade unionists all around the state. Um, you know, I mean, I think it's, it, depending on, on the surveys you look at, um, mm. uh, the, the public attitudes towards unions actually are considerably more positive than the conventional wisdom might suggest. Um, and we, you know, ever since the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which revised the, Sh the Wagner Act of 1935, it was really in many ways the kind of Magna Carta for labor that established for the first time um, a, a rigorous procedure for enabling unions to, um, to develop uh, the basis for collective bargaining. Um, We've seen a kind of unremitting uh, public relations campaign against unions in this country mm -hmm. that is just uh, quite, uh, quite astounding. Um, and you know, using very sophisticated media has, in some ways, kind of reshaped at the most superficial level uh, public uh, attitudes uh, toward unions. Um, there's no question that levels of unionization have fallen uh, dramatically, and mm -hmm. it's a byproduct of a whole set of circumstances, mm -hmm. among them the changing fabric of American employment. I mean, we, you know, with the deindustrialization we talk about was literally a deindustrialization that, that affected the most unionized mm -hmm. sectors uh, of the economy, and not surprisingly, um, that led to a decline. But um, it's also the ability of capital to, to, to move. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And this has been a chronic problem, again, going back to my period, the 19th century. Um, employers only, only had to threaten, you know, that we're going to pull the shop out if you folks don't kind of ease off on your demands uh, to get a kind of uh, a degree of uh, complicity and quiescence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, today, there, there's a really interesting study by a historian named Jeff Cowie who looked at uh, the RCA Corporation, whose uh, original plant was in Camden, New Jersey. And when faced with a really effective uh, trade union, uh, namely the United Electrical Workers of America, uh, and under the, you know, the governing authority of the Wagner Act, uh, simply pulled up stakes and moved to Bloomington, Indiana, where mm -hmm. it thought, hmm, this is going to be safe. Uh, we're not going to have a union problem here. Well, lo and behold, within, uh, within a decade or two, uh, the workers at the RCA plant in Bloomington decided they weren't happy with the conditions that they were being offered, and they began to organize. So RCA pulled up and moved to Memphis. 
this is not, not their whole operation, but the core of their operation, moved to Memphis. They stayed in Memphis for five years, and then where did they go? Ciudad Juarez, uh, mm -hmm. in the Maquilladoras. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so there is this capacity in, um, in the, the, the American uh, industrial order, let's call mm -hmm. it capitalism, to, uh, to kind of shift production uh, mm -hmm. in quite um, uh, dramatic ways that mm -hmm. undermine the ability of workers on an ongoing mm -hmm. basis to maintain a level of organization that would, that would protect them. But Jen, well, and I think one thing I would want to interject, because I know our time is also short, yeah. um, is just to acknowledge that not only has globalization had profound impacts for native born US workers, but obviously our workforce is is globalized in the US. And to acknowledge that I think particularly right now within the labor movement, um, there's a real um, uh, uh, momentum uh, behind acknowledging that um, people come here not just with their poverty or you know fleeing in some cases political persecution, but they come here with their experience of struggle. And some of the most important um, uh, new developments in organizing and trying to raise standards from the bottom up, particularly in low-wage workplaces, are being led by um, immigrant workers. And that's also true in Iowa, um, certainly true in Iowa workplaces where you know there are factories in Des Moines and uh, uh, Marshalltown and Waterloo and around the state where in some cases people are speaking up, uh, upward of a dozen different languages. Um, and you know, there's a whole movement um, across the country to figure out, um, given the, the real challenges and decades worth of uh, sort of uh, uh, anti-union onslaught, um, how to come up with alternative strategies for effectively uh, restoring some of those basic um, expectations about workplace fairness and living wages and uh, dignity. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, and I mean, it's been immigrant workers very often in this country who have been at the forefront of mm -hmm. organization, and in part because they brought with them these traditions of, organ of, of organization and a culture of organization that they b brought to this country. One of my favorite qu questions that I like to ask in my classes, my labor history classes, is uh, wh what students think is the most unionized city in the country? And uh, some will say Detroit, and some will say Chicago, and some will say um, other, other major metropolitan areas. And in fact, it's Las Vegas. Oh, and, yeah. and it's Las Vegas among uh, what we would call service sector workers who are overwhelmingly immigrants and workers of color. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so th that's exactly the kind of thing that Jen was describing. These mm -hmm. are the folks who are at the forefront of sustaining and building a new labor movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, thank you so much. It's a wonderful segment. So Marcella David, Shel Stromquist, and Jennifer Scherer, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we come into our last segment of the evening now with uh, two guests I'm very excited to uh, bring uh, here to the stage. Alex Granton is joining me just to my left here. He's a UI Foundation Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering, and he's also the Dean of the College of Engineering. And next to him is Dean Oskvig, a graduate of the UI College of Engineering and the President and CEO of BNV Energy, Black and Veatch's global energy business. Mr. Oskvig and his wife have established the Oskvig Global Engineering Scholarship which will aid engineering students who have a commitment to improving the quality of life in developing communities around the world. And I believe Mrs. Osvig is with us in the audience. Yes, hi, nice to have you. So, very nice to meet you, Mr. Osvig, and thank you, Alec, for coming. Thank you, my pleasure. Yeah, well, I think I would like to uh, start with uh, you, Alec, and have you just give us a little bit of an overview of, of what kind of uh, engineering education you provide when it comes to a global world out there. Sure. I'd be very happy to do that. Um, well, certainly globalization is a major theme in the field of engineering, and I think most of the program today helps illustrate, you know, some of the many aspects of globalization. And many of the previous speakers talked about how Iowa needs manufacturing, uh, needs a workforce that can compete in a global environment. Uh, so one of the main aspects of late, as we've revised our curriculum, is to prepare engineers, prepare students uh, to thrive and excel in this globalized uh, economy. And an important aspect is to understand different cultures, to be able to work in multi-ethnic, 
uh, multinational teams. Uh, most companies are multinational, and many of the other engineers they'll work with, they may never meet face to face, but mm. they'll meet in various, um, over the internet, mm. the various Skype, uh, et cetera. But they'll be working with team members from all over the world. Uh, in addition, as the markets and all over the world develop, their customers will be from all over the world, and the considerations in designing new products and processes are very different than what they may have encountered in the United States or, or here in Iowa. Mm -hmm. uh, so we come up with strategies to inform students so when they graduate they have some appreciation for, for what is happening uh, in this mm -hmm. very complex uh, globalization phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that one of the things that um, the College of Engineering does in, in coordination with one of our offices in international programs, which study abroad, is, is um, you take students to places like Ghana to work on water sanitation oh, exactly. projects. Exactly. You take students to Nicaragua to build bridges, uh, to many, many, right. many points around the world, and, and it's just phenomenal. We hear the reports back from the students and sometimes the faculty, and they, and you know, just an unbelievable experience for a young person to, to be out there doing something in the real world that is actually helping someone uh, at the moment they're there. Right. Well, that's, a, that's a great point, uh, Joan. In order to do what I talked about, projects are often the best way where the students get involved in a project, building something in Ghana, in Mexico, in Peru. Um, many of our students are very in inspired by making a difference in uh, the developing world. In mm -hmm. fact, we have a class called Design for the Developing mm -hmm. World that has resulted in new inventions, award-winning new invention for very inexpensively uh, purifying water mm -hmm. that you could do without electricity, without the grid, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, but some of the other projects are, are with the, the developed world where there's a team of engineering students here at Iowa working with a team of students in Marseille, France, for example, mm -hmm. on a real world project that comes from industry. Uh, they get experience with the uh, process of working without meeting face to face, although usually they end up meeting <laughs> face to face at the end with the Iowa mm -hmm. students going to Marseille in the spring. And interestingly, the Marseille students come to Iowa in February, so I think we get the, we get the bigger, better deal of, <laughs> I think so. uh, better part of that deal. Um, but yeah, that, that's yeah. one of the key strategies that I think is very effective, mm -hmm. use project-based learning. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, Mr. Osvig, let me uh, just turn to you. May I call you Dean? Uh, okay. Um, uh, you have had a long and very fine career in the energy business. You've worked many, many places around the, the globe. Right. And um, uh, I don't know if you've retired or if you're going to continue to work for many years now, but you and your wife have clearly decided that it's important to help fund opportunities for students to, to be active in the developing world. It, it is. And it, you're the second person today that wonders if I'm retired. So. I'm sorry. Perhaps I shouldn't <laughs> but, have asked. I'm not. <laughs> um, it is. You know, I really liked what I heard uh, Dean Scranton say about the opportunities we're providing to young people to early get a taste of, you know, what goes on in the developing country and, and the sort of things that uh, engineering-oriented people can do yeah. to, to solve problems there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking back in my time here at, at Iowa, I, I don't remember us having those sort of opportunities, but in fact, being here at Iowa was my first exposure, I would say, to uh, multiple cultures, mm -hmm. and some of the friends that, that I uh, made in, through my engineering study work here. And then, um, you know, by good fortune, I joined a, a multinational company, uh, originated in Kansas City, by the way, and, and now we operate in, uh, uh, we have 100 offices around the mm -hmm. world. Uh, I think we speak 65 languages. Mm -hmm. uh, the official business language of Black & Beach, quite like a a lot of multinational companies is broken English, uh, <laughs> but you can get by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, engineers by their their nature are problem solvers. Yeah, you know, we take you know scientific principles and we apply them economically. And if I think about what we've been calling tonight globalization, the way you do that then it has to be suited to the culture of where you're delivering that that infrastructure or that product. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's so important for us to talk openly about the, the importance of culture and understanding the differences. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and having had so much experience, both both you and your wife, both in the nonprofit right. world and and also in your actual uh, profession, um, are there examples of of um, experiences you had where you you really ran up against a cultural difference and you you had to come to terms with it quickly? Uh, yeah. Well, what I found was um, simultaneously how different things are, but how alike they are. Mm. Um, you know, human beings all strive for the same sort of things like security and, and economic uh, well-being, et cetera, but it's how they go about doing that. And, you know, I can remember a, uh, a negotiation I was in in Pakistan, and um, or so I approached it in my typical, uh, you know, American style, we're about results, right, where it's all about the results. And in fact, in a place like Pakistan, process is just as important as results. And, it, and I, I just got very frustrated with how it just seemed to iterate and iterate and iterate. And, but it, it, just through time and experience, you realize that that's the sort of effort you need to put into it. You'll, you'll likely end up at the same place anyway. Mm -hmm. It's just the path that you, you get to do that. But I, I remember the uh, kick under the table from our Pakistani associate um, when we got to a point where I was asserting things that I thought needed to be asserted uh -huh. and in fact it was the wrong thing to do at that time. So we had some conversations in the hallway about mm -hmm. you know, how this should go. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, it's, about, it's about that simple. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and engineering is just about as, as um, global and operation right. as, as anything could possibly be, isn't it? Any, any kind of invention, any kind of improvement to one's, um, I mean, any product we use. Uh, somebody has designed it. Somebody has hoped they've created the thing that will crack the market in, a, in another spot, or in your case, producing energy. And, and I know right. that it's not just energy from fossil fuels. You're, you're involved in... All forms. Right. All forms. You know, if you look at Black & Beach as a company, mm -hmm. we deal in critical human structure only. You know, it's, it's energy, it's water, telecommunications, and then work for the U.S. federal government in the area of security and safety. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the critical human infrastructure, the things that improve the quality of life and enable commerce. That, that's all we do. So we really have something good going for us because we picked that place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, our, our vision statement says, or I'm sorry, mission statement is building a world of difference. And that really resonates with, uh, with the young people hmm. because you, know, you associate that with critical human infrastructure. And we operate in two types of worlds, right? The one world is high household incomes, low economic growth, and a demand for optimization of existing, existing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Well, I just described North America and Western Europe. The other world is low household incomes, high economic growth, and a demand for capacity. Mm. Two different fundamental problems to solve, and so what you do varies. How you do it is culturally determined. But the thing we have going for us as engineers, the laws of physics are the same. <laughs> <laughs> you pick the place, the laws of physics are the same. Mm -hmm. So what are you hoping that um, your scholarship will do for UI engineering students? Well. Um, what I want through that scholarship is, you know, it's, it needs to attach to young people who have some notion that they're going to practice their profession in a developing country. That's, that's the objective here. And so that's to get them that initial uh, experience in doing that. And my ex expectation is just like it was for me when I got exposed to things outside of Iowa, mm -hmm. outside of, you know, I talked about multi multiculturalism at Iowa. You know, I met people from Ecuador, uh, you know, from Bangladesh, from Alabama, right, from New York. You know, that was all a, all a new thing. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, it's to open up the eyes and, and find out what can be done mm -hmm. and then, you know, get that passion for solving problems, you know, in, around the world. I think the most important problems the world is facing right now will be solved with engineering solutions. And the places that it can't be done, that's more about bad governance than it is, you know, the ability to solve the technical problem. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, speaking from your experience, did you have you had um, occasions where you encountered very bad governance, and you just you just thought, oh my gosh, we don't even want to be in this place yeah. at this time? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, sure, um, but you know some of the other issues, uh, some of the other people talked about earlier, um, and, and we talked about uh, you know c corporate values and and yeah. some of these other things. What I found is is if you stay straight down the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. according to your, your values, uh, you will be okay, mm -hmm. but you have to stay straight on to your values, and, and you'll get to the place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that jives nicely, I'm sure, with what you try to teach your students in the College of Engineering, right? Oh, a absolutely, and uh, I have some hopes for the scholarship, and I'm sure that uh, Dean and Tammy are going to find that they're going to meet some students. There'll be a lot of students that will fit uh, the profile they're looking for, it's amazing how our College of Engineering on, on the campus with the major liberal arts and sciences college, the law college, the business college, uh, we attract students who have interest in all of these areas mm -hmm. and we have ways of engaging them in all of these mm -hmm. areas. Many of them want to make the difference in the developing world. Um, so they're going to have the pleasure of meeting some <laughs> energetic young students and the young students are going to benefit from them in ways that I think I have a little better understanding than they, than they do right now, mm -hmm. but I think they'll find that that's going to be uh, something very rewarding as well. Yeah. And I like, yeah. the, I like your notion of the different colleges you know, integrating together because it, it really does become important to have that holistic mm -hmm. view of things. So when I um, advise people who have an indica or a, a notion that they're getting into engineering, you, know, you ought to couple that with some study of business and I think just as important now, mm -hmm. it's a study of culture. Mm -hmm. You know, those three pieces, the technical, the business side, mm -hmm. and culture. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that most moved you in uh, countries you visited where you thought, you know, gee, it'd be good if we, we've got to find a way to do something here. I'm talking about health, education, uh, the kind of daily struggles people go through. Um, were there particular things that caught your Well, passion? you know, it gets back to this, this notion of, you know, of energy, water, you know, telecommunications. Um, Barry Butler, when he was Dean of Engineering, gave me a, a book, I think it was published by the National Science Academy, where they studied the most impactful technologies in the last century on the, the uh, quality of life in a society. Right at the top of the list was electrification, you know, and right behind that was water. Now, you think about electrification enables lots of other things, yeah. right? And clean water has more to do with health mm -hmm. than a lot of advances in, in medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to be part of that, mm -hmm. right, and then be in different places in the world and see what the benefits are of delivering that infrastructure, mm -hmm. that's the big payoff, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're improving the quality of life in all of these societies where we operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the things that Shell Stromquist said. He, he hated to be the one to talk about some of the negative things that are a, yeah. a product of, or that go along with globalization. But I, but I hear that there is also, you know, there, there are tremendous opportunities to do good and to, yeah. Let me give you an example of yeah. not a direct experience of mine, but one uh -huh. of my colleagues, you know, the, the uh, gentleman that uh, runs our federal business. We, we have projects in Afghanistan. One of them is a power project. And... Um, and one of our engineers, uh, a woman engineer, by the way, worked in, Pac or in Afghanistan for us on this power system, and she was talking to a, a young mother who told her what electricity meant, uh, you know, coming into her home. She said, because that light bulb up there means I don't have to worry about scorpions on my baby. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, that the room home. usually freezes yes. when you, when you right. say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what we do. That's what you do. Yeah, gosh. Well, much success, uh, Dean Oskvig yeah. and, and also uh, Dean Scranton. And this is wonderful to have you here with us this evening. I appreciate your long drive from Kansas City. Thank My you pleasure. very much for coming. So please stay here with me while I, I uh, say goodbye to everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of our program, and I'd like to say thanks to everybody who participated tonight and those of you who joined us here in the room. World Canvas is a production of international programs at the University of Iowa. Production partners are the Hawkeye Network, UI Pentecrest Museums, KRU, 
IUI and Information Technology Services. This program will be broadcast on cable services around the state, on the Hawkeye Network, and on Iowa Public Radio, and on KRUI-FM. Uh, free worldwide listening is available through iTunes and the Public Radio Exchange. More information can be found at international.uiowa.edu. Here's an invitation to join us on January 25th here in this room again at 5 o'clock, and um, our next World Canvas is called The Rupture of Civil War. We have a wonderful program lined up, and I hope you can join us. Um, thanks to my production colleagues in international programs, Caitlin McBride, Amy Green, Connie Shea, and Shana Oley. Also to Christopher Clough and the Hawkeye Network technical team. So that's it for this edition of World Canvas. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you.